Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It's 2 p.m. and you're welcome to the Young Ophthalmology Forum quarterly webinar. Today we begin our Catra series. Our Catra series is designed to expound on cataract surgery from patient selection to post-op care and refraction. Um, I would want to advise that we all keep our microphones muted so as not to make the session become rowdy. We are live on YouTube and also on Zoom. If you can't join us on Zoom, please do well to join us on YouTube. Our panelists are ready and will, will be giving us I'll be telling us some things on cataract surgery this afternoon. We are, we are honored to have Dr. Adamu Abdullahi and Dr. Temi Tokbeyewete as panelists today. And most of us YOs would have passed under the tutelage of either Dr. Adamu Abdullahi or Dr. Temi Tokbeyewete during our residency training or during our, the course of learning cataract surgery. So we have seasoned teachers with us today. And just before we start, we'll be running a poll. It's an anonymous poll. It is in no way academic. It's a poll that is designed to um, give us, make us, um, give us a little idea of how we practice in our centers as regards cataract surgery, patient selection, and IOL selection. So the poll is coming up now. It's an anonymous poll, and we have 60 seconds for the poll. So please let's go ahead and um, and pick answers to the poll. It's an anonymous poll designed to assess, not to assess our knowledge, but just to give us an idea of how we practice or as regards our views on patient selection for cataract surgery and IOL selection. Okay, so we have our poll results. Okay, so from the results, we see that majority of participants would only operate patients who are 660 or worse, and then 636 or worse. So, and then um, an absolute contraindication to cataract surgery is an infection anywhere on the face or an infection anywhere. So it's good to know that hyperglycemia or elevated blood pressure is not a consideration in deferring cataract surgery. And then also we all know and think and agree that biometry is important, irrespective of the cost to benefit ratio. So we know that biometry is important in cataract um, in um, cataract surgery. And then we, well, this is not a surprising um, result. We see that our IOL choice is dependent on what we have in our stock. So I think this is a, this is a, common, it's a common result amongst third world countries where we do not have the, the, the privilege of having a lot of IOL stock in our store of different designs, different types, different series, 
most of us will have just PMMA in our stock. And that determines what kind of I uh, will use in our practice. So I think that's a good, that's good. So this gives us an idea of, of um, gives us an idea of what we are going to be discussing today. So, um, So our, our resource persons today are, like I said earlier, Dr. Adamu and Dr. Temi Wete. Dr. Adamu will be taking us on patient selection, while Dr. Ewete will be taking us on IOL selection. Um, so um, Dr. Ewete will start on IOL selection. We seem to be having some um, technical issues with um, Dr. Adamu's and connection. I think he's having issues with his weather and that may be affecting his connection. So um, while we wait for him, I'd like to just tell us a little about our panelists today. Dr. Temito Poyawete is well known to the YO crew and um, she's well known for her love for cataract surgery and her love for cataract surgical training. She's engaged us on our platform, social media platforms, multiple times on mentorship during cataract surgical training. And mentorship during cataract surgical training, and also continuing enhancing and gathering skills. She's currently a consultant ophthalmologist with the Maxi Specialist Hospital of the Redditing Group. Um, she's an international scholar. She's a Wills Eye Hospital International Scholar. And she's also received advanced training in phaco education and cataract surgery from the Ragudeep Eye Hospital in India. She specializes in the anterior segment, especially cataract surgery, including pediatric surgery, traumatic cataract surgery, and complex cataract cases. Uh, those of us who attend the anterior segment group in the OSN would know that she's very passionate about anterior segment and cataract surgeries as she's presented multiple times in the anterior segment subspecialty group at OSN meetings. She'll be taking us today on um, IOL selection for cataract surgery, biometry and IOL selection. Our other um, faculty is Dr. Adamu Abdullahi. He's also one person who has handed the scalpel to a lot of YOs. And some white O's have reached out to me and told me that um, he was the first person who gave them the chance to hold his scalpel during their residency training. So we have someone who is used to teaching and who um, will be taking us on patient selection. He's currently a visiting coordinator ophthalmologist to the Yobe State Teaching Hospital and also to countless other hospitals. Um, for example, he's a visiting ophthalmologist to the Bono State Specialist and um, Eye Hospital, Meduguri. Is also a visiting consultant to the Bashira Eye Specialist Hospital in Jigawa State. So he's a widely traveled eye specialist. He was one time the DC Mark of the Yobe State Teaching um, Hospital. And um, he's currently um, passionate about cataract surgery and trust segment surgeries and mentoring and teaching of residents. He's um, both politically and He's both politically and uh, academically astute. He's had, um, he's had, he's had um, exposures both in politics and medi medicine. So we have an all-rounder with us today. Unfortunately, internet service prov 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 provision is, um, is um, dealing with us. So we, we've had our faculties and um, summarily exit, but they are back now. Dr. Adamu is back with us. So Dr. Adamu will start. We have um, 20 minutes for 20 minutes for every speaker. 
And then we'll have questions at the end of all discussions. So please send your questions to Q&A. If you're on YouTube, please send your questions. Your questions will be taken here. At the end of both presentations, we'll have all questions handled. Okay, so Dr. Adamu is ready. So he will start while we uh, while we listen to him. Please keep your questions ready. Send your questions in. We will take all questions at the end of both presentations. So special considerations for operable cataract, patient call, patient selection, identification, and counseling. So Dr. Adamu, thank you very much. Okay, thank Floor you. Is yours. Dr. Uh, first of all, I must appreciate the YOF for to make this presentation among my colleagues and this is just going to be like an interactive session where we can discuss salient issues that have to do with selection of patients for cataract surgery uh, so we know uh, by way of introduction cataract is the leading cause of blindness worldwide and cataract surgery is the commonly performed procedure worldwide, not only in ophthalmic practice, but in medical practice. And cataract surgery is the most cost-effective intervention in the field of medicine. And therefore, it is a wish of every ophthalmologist to be an excellent surgeon. However, we have to understand that what we are after, most especially by the ideals of this presentation is not just for us to be good surgeons, but to be excellent surgeons. We must know that knowing how to operate simply makes you to be a good surgeon. Whereas if you want to be a better surgeon, you not only know how to operate, but you must have that ability to decide when to operate. The excellent surgeon is the one that knows when not to operate. That is the one that will be able to separate the difficult situations from the simple cases. So, however, generally we know the outcome of cataract surgery, whether it is going to be good or bad, depends on our choice of making selection of the patient, the surgery that we perform, that is the spectacle correction or the correction of refractive error that we have, and at the same time also the complication that might arise in the surgery may affect the outcome. Where we have no complications, the outcome is definitely going to be good. Where we have complications, the why we have complications, the outcome is going to be very uh, poor. So what we aim to do in this presentation is to look at how to make selection for cataract surgery. And to select patients for cataract surgery requires a thorough evaluation of the patient. And the essence of this thorough evaluation is for one to make and establish the need for the requirement for the surgery or not, and also whether it is appropriate at that particular time to operate the patient or not. Then it also gives us the opportunity to know the expected surgical program and associated comorbidities that are associated with just that cataract. With that, we can have an influence on the cataract and decide both between the surgeon and the patient to know what exactly to do, whether to operate or not to operate. And then, so the evaluation of patients for cataract surgery actually goes a long way in knowing the history, taking the good history for the case management. And this history is both ocular and systemic. Then we also need to examine the patient properly, both the ocular examination and systemic examination. We may as well need to investigate where necessary, do some specific ophthalmic investigation, and also some systemic investigations and may be warranted by that individual case. We have to emphasize here that 
whatever it is you do, especially in terms of examining investigation of a patient with cataract surgery, must be individualized based on what has been identified in the history and examination of that patient. Through this process, one will definitely determine whether the cataract is operable or not. Then the decision will be taken whether it will operate it or not. Now, the use of the term operable cataract actually is a very relative term with no universal standardized definition for an operable cataract. However, most literatures tend to look at a cataract with a visual acuity of less than 360 or a visual acuity of less than 660 to be an operable cataract. But circumstances abound where a patient with 66 vision can equally be operated depending on the system that he's having. We have published a report where patients with even 65 vision with disturbing glare were operated. So the term is relative, the patient and the surgeon and what disturb the patient. So in essence, it is used to define a cataract where the patient and the surgeon agree to proceed with the cataract surgery. So every operable cataract where visual loss is justifying surgery can receive surgery if they so wish. So here it is the decision of the patient and sometimes even with the expertise of the surgeon and the available facilities at his hand. Patient with 618 vision, if you are a good surgeon, you have the good focal facilities and other things, you can go ahead and operate. Patient with 66 vision, if he so disturbs by symptoms like glare can equally be operated by a surgeon that have the capability and the experience to operate on the patient. So in essence, it is where the patient and the surgeon agree to present with the cataract surgeries. There are so many indications for cataract surgery, but commonly we know we decide to operate a cataract based on either reasons to get visual correction, which might be for near or for far. Then there could be medical indications, most especially in instances where we have like a focal anaphylactic, pharmacomorphic or pharmacolytic cataract, where in such instances, we may not be aiming at getting a good visual outcome, but for us to relieve the patient of his pains and other things, we have to. There are instances also that cataract may be an obstruction for us either evaluate a patient with posterior segment pathology or for us to do a posterior segment procedure such as laser application in diabetic retinopathy or evaluation of some patient with some form of retinal detachment. In such instances, the cataract may be surgery may be performed for medical reasons, not just for visual restoration. There are also situations where we need to do cataract surgery just for cosmetic reasons to get a black people to a patient with a totally blind eye. But these are things that I've mentioned earlier to go with agreement between patient and the surgeon. So, but there are situations that no matter what, we either have to temporize the surgery to address certain conditions or we may absolutely have to suspend the surgery at all, notwithstanding the insistence of the patient to have the operation. Such are the situation that we say cataract surgery is contraindicated. One such instance is when we have an active focus of infection on the face. Such may eventually result in an ophthalmitis, which is an ophthalmologist's nightmare. So where we have an infection either in the eye or around the eye, it's always good to suspend surgery and treat the infection. Then the surgery can be performed later. Then there are some secondary cataracts that when you do the surgery, you may not get any appreciable visual improvement. So in such instances, cataract surgery may be contraindicated. Such cataracts may also be referred to as non-operable cataract, like when we have a generalized progressive retinal atrophy. Or in some forms of traumatic cataract, the patient may have high expectation of visual restoration, but no amount of specialized surgery will restore vision. Complicated cataract, secondary to uveitis, or even a simple cataract with an associated uveitis may need 
to be considered with seriousness before a surgeon will take his scalpel and operate such a patient. Corneal diseases and other anterior segment diseases like keratoconus, corneal dystrophy, and corneal degenerations might not be absolute contraindication to cataract surgery, but for the naive surgeon, you have to refer the patient to an anterior segment specialist, which will be a graded procedure first to address the keratoconus and other issues that are treatable or they are, can be controlled before the cataract surgery can be performed. Then when you have a cataract in a setting of other significant other pathologies, we have also to be very cautious of operating such patients. For instance, if you have advanced glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, or retinal detachment, when you weigh and find out that the significant loss of vision is due to those pathologies, not the cataract, and cataract surgery will not change the visual status of the patient, then such are cases that also need to be avoided. So with this in mind, it's important for us to know how to evaluate or how to properly select a patient for cataract surgery. The first important thing is to know the ocular history of the patient. This is aimed to understand the patient problem and the impact of the cataract on the quality of life of the patient. So here too, the patient needs have to be contextualized or have to be personalized in the context of the patient. What might be the visual needs of a farmer will be different from the visual needs of a university lecturer. So the symptoms must be analyzed in the context of the presence of a cataract. And we also have to know the symptoms of presentation of the patient may differ with the morphological types of the cataract. Whereas some cataracts may affect a distant vision more than the near vision, like nuclear cataract, we may also have some cataracts that may adversely affect near vision more than the distant vision, like posterior subcapsular cataract. So these are ways that the patient presentation, not just saying that the patient has a poor vision, but which component of the vision is affected? Is it distance? Is it near? Are they associated loss of contact sensitivity? Are they associated loss of peripheral vision? This put together will give the surgeon an idea of the type and manner of the cataract, uh, cataract the patient is having and will go a long way in assisting the patient in properly planning for the surgery. Other symptoms that we need to consider so significantly are additional symptoms. Such additional symptoms that are ocular may either suggest an alternate diagnosis or may give us the possibility of special preparedness for that particular patient. For instance, presence of flashes, flutters, heaviness, metamorphia could be something that we have to take into consideration for posterior segment diseases that may possibly be the major cause of the loss of vision of that particular patient. The same thing goes for having associated discharge, redness, or coexisting uberties, photophobia, and other things that may defy the surgery to a later time. So these are components of our ocular history that we need to. Past ocular history is very important. Some patients now know that before the cataract, they have some premorbid ocular condition that might possibly be receiving treatment. The patient may know he has some retinal diseases like diabetic retinopathies, uh, retinitis pigmentosa, or even uh, some retinal degenerative diseases. Some know before the onset of the cataract, they have refractive errors that have been taken care of for glaucoma. So these are important things we need to know for patients that know. For those that don't know they have this, this is why our examination of the patient will be very important. And for those that know the pre-existing or pre-morbid condition, any treatment that they are receiving may have bearing on the plan and on the prognosis. We have to discuss that how those pathologies may affect the prognosis. There might be some of the patients that might be on treatment that the treatment they are on will affect the, also our planning. For instance, a patient, a glaucoma patient that had been on pilocarpine or that had been on a prostaglandin analogs. These are 
things that we really need to know and take appropriate measures before we proceed for surgery. Then for some patients too, we need to assess and evaluate their medical history. Commonly, this will help us to identify factors that have bearing on the timing. Patient respond to stress because as it may seem simple, cataract surgery is still a very stressful to the metabolic system of the patient. So, and also those medical conditions will guide us to know how cooperative the patient will be intra op uh, and how compliant will the patient be post-operatively. Common conditions that we need to properly address are hypertension and diabetes. These are diseases that are common in patients that present with senile cataract. However, in our situation in the middle income countries, these are something that is underdiagnosed because a lot of the patient, the eye problem will be the first presentation to the hospital. They don't know they are diabetic or they don't know they're hypertensive. So it's a call for serious attention to try to rule in or rule out the possibility of diabetic mellitus or hypertension as they may affect cause of surgery and post-operative outcome of the surgery. Some patients with uh, either chronic cardiac, pulmonary or cerebrovascular diseases, we need to also know because it may influence their cooperation during surgery and equally affect their treatment. Like uh, also, we need also to look at issues like prostatism, such symptoms as frequency, um, dysuria, and also some other urinary tract infection. Commonly, we know it is used to be said that the three grades of aging are gray hair, gray lens, and gray prostate. For surgeons that are used to ECCE, it is always good to know that the patient is not having the irritative symptoms of prostatism because sometimes training and other things may come with complications for a well-performed surgery. Other conditions also that we may need to take a special consideration are diseases that may affect the posture of the patient during the surgery. Parkinson's disease, scoliosis, kyphosis, these are conditions that we may need to have some special arrangement for lying the patient down to do the surgery. So these are things that if they are appropriately planned and assessed, you get a very good outcome. Social history in such patients may not just be important in trying to say either smoking, alcohol is related as the risk factor. We know it, those can be risk factors for the development of cataract, but it's equally important to establish them because they may affect the post-operative outcome. For instance, a patient that smokes, he may have some coughing after the surgery, which may affect the surgery. Drug or substance abuse and alcohol may have influence on takeoff of anesthesia for the patient and equally post-operative compliance to directives that may be given to the patient. One that abuses drugs or alcohol may not necessarily comply with all the post-operative orders that we give them. Drug history, especially anticoagulants, antihypertensive, may affect the cataract. Most important is use of systemic alpha blockers, like in patients with prostatic that they were given. We may end up having issues like intraoperative fluffy iris syndrome. So these are things that we need to establish and take appropriate measures before we perform the cataract surgery. Then ocular examination should concentrate on knowing what are the patient's complaints and the factors likely to adversely affect the outcome. We should go, it's not enough to just look at a white people and say the patient has cataract. There are factors that may adversely affect the outcome and those factors might be local like infection, in the conjunctiva, the lacrimal system. And there may be factors that may need us to modify our routine cataract surgery. Maybe the patient may have a posterior sinicia. And there are factors that may also predict the potential of vision that we need to discuss with the patient preoperatively. This underscores the importance of a thorough and proper visual or ocular examination for patients with cataract. So we need to assess the visual ICT both for distance and near to know which one is more adversely affected by the pathology, 
we also need to assess the spins and status of the patient to rule out the possibility of amblyopia, and also need to look carefully for the ocular adenexia, most especially looking for the possibility of the nephritis, intrusion, lack of thalamus, which invariably may affect the outcome of the cataract. Lacrimal sac syringing or assessment for infection is one thing that we don't normally do, but it's equally very important. Assessing conjunctival infection for congestion, scarring, and other things. Like the African patient may hide for you, but on examination, you are likely to pick it. So corneal examination, one of the commonest complications we may have is uh, corneal edema. These are things that we can assess the risk of patient having corneal edema preoperatively to assess for the presence of stromal opacity, gutata, Isaiah capis, and also the anterior segment, uh, anterior chamber must be assessed in terms of depth, activity. Uh, some instances may even warrant gonoscopic examination to evaluate the presence of synechia, neovascularization, especially in a setting where you have a diabetic retinopathy or any of those uh, macrovascular diseases of the retina, isolated macular degeneration, if they exist. Maybe you'll be able to see the neovascularization at the angle. The pupil reactivity and the presence of RAPD is one good sign of the potential vision in a patient, even in a resource poor setting like ours. So these are areas that we need to put more emphasis to see whether there is good reactivity, presence of RAPD or not. The lens is the primary area where the patient's problem is and where the surgeon is going to perform. So we need to assess the morphology of the cataract, the density of the cataract, and correlate whatever findings we have with the patient's complaint and the visual acuity. Then only we'll be able to appreciate whether the problem of the patient is lens-related or due to other ocular comorbidities. One very good area that needs careful assessment is the status of the zonules. Because uh, in patients with severe exploratory syndrome, we are likely to get zonules that are weak, fragile, and also poor genesis. These are conditions that call for special caution during surgery. So these are some things that we need to consider in the examination. Fundal examination is very important. Most especially, we have to do it both in dilated and we have to be both direct and indirect of the muscle Here we'll be able to ascertain the presence or otherwise of other retinal diseases or vitreous diseases that may adversely affect the outcome of the surgery. Where we need to assess the presence in our setting of diabetic retinopathy, retinal detachment, related macular degeneration or glaucoma. Then we need to assess the intraocular pressure too which we need to give a priority management, whether sometimes we may even decide in the setting where we, the patient has glaucoma, that we may need to do combined procedure or a sequential procedure, or just to do a simple cataract surgery. Then some examinations are not for all patients, but based on the findings from the history and examination, there are certain investigations that we really need to do. So like specular microscopy, we need to do it sometimes because we want to assess the possibility of having a corneal edema. So when we have less than 1,000 cells per micrometer, a micrometer of is a contraindication. The same thing goes for pachymetry when we have a thickness of more than 600 micrometer, then it might also herald the possibility of having corneal edema. In some instances, there may be need for assessment of the potential visual acuity of the patient using such thing as potential acuity meter interferometry and also molecular function tests. The patient may need to have refraction biometry, and in most of African cataracts that are present to us, where they are very dense cataract that Fundoscopy, we may not be able to get any information. It will be good for such patients to have this scan. 
to ascertain the status of the retina. This is the presence or otherwise of retinal detachment. Also, if there is history that will be suggested. Laboratory investigations need to be individualized also. For example, to a patient with medical condition, it will be good to assess their free blood count, including PCD. And for patients that are also going for general anesthesia, we need to know their electrolyte level and creatinine. And for patients that have some things that points to kidney diseases or their vulnerability to having kidney diseases, diabetes, hypertensive, it's always good to also assess their renal status through electrolyte level and creatinine. Mineralities may be simple but informative in assessing non symptomatic diabetic patients. So it may be a simple test, but sometimes it will prevent the surgeon from going into a serious risk of operating on a diabetic that is not controlled. We may need to do conjunctival swabs uh, for MCS when you will be able to culture some things that are just the normal flora. Chest X-ray and ECG, most especially for those with a very advanced age and some cardiopulmonary diseases, we need to be assessed. So overall, when assessing a patient or selecting a patient that's uh, for cataract surgery, there are some red flags that we really need to be looking out for. And that might be either ocular comorbidities or systemic comorbidities. Among the ocular comorbidities that we may be seen looking for are things like primary open glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, and other posterior segment diseases. When we identify such cases, where it needs to be controlled, we need to control them. We need to counsel the patient properly. And knowing the limit of our skills, some of them we need to refer them to our colleagues with a better skills, with a better facilities to manage them. Patients also with systemic comorbidities, we may be looking for those with diabetic mellitus, hypertension, chronic obstructive airway diseases, ischemic heart diseases, Parkinson's disease. They need to be properly controlled. And in such instances, these are patients that they need home management with physicians. And some of them may need surgery and their general anesthesia. So as an ophthalmologist, it will always be good for us to agree with our physician and anesthetist for such patients. In the setting of concrete disability, we also need to make appropriate preparedness. We may be operating on the deaf under local anesthesia also. There are certain things that we may need to consider. Or we may be operating on a patient with some disabilities that may not allow him to properly lie down. So we need to prepare and also plan for the best way to operate on such a patient. The one thing that I need to emphasize here for those that are practicing in the third world, there is also a changing paradigm, which is a big challenge uh, to clinical practice. We need to always carry our patient along. So we, whatever our findings in the course of evaluation of the patient, we need to explain it to the patient in clear terms. We need to engage them in a discussion, direct discussion. We also need to communicate it to them in a way that they will understand. Um, whatever it is that is found, whatever it is that is discussed, need to be documented. And whatever it is that is planned, need to be documented with the patient. Some patients that have high, some high risk, they do not only need to sign the conventional consent form, but equally need to sign a high risk consent form. So always carry the patient along as you plan to manage our patient. So the take home message here is when we are selecting a patient for cataract surgery is we need to identify the patient visual demands and pre-existing medical problem that could be ocular or systemic. When we identify such comorbidities, we need to optimize them and we need to plan appropriately for the procedure that may minimize risks to the patient and maximize benefits for the patient. Where we anticipate problems, we need to plan for such problem. And for each patient, we need to formulate an individualized surgical plan. It's not just enough to say, I plan this patient for right fecal, for right small incision cataract surgery. 
maybe there are some additional things that you need to do strengthenectomy whatsoever you need to explicitly formulate and individualize your surgical plan and in all this you need to carry the patient along in all the stages of our preparation so this is my take home message for my colleagues thank you for listening thank you very much dr damo abdullah uh, you kept exactly to tie that's that's wonderful uh, you you during your the course of your discussion you kept harping on a particular point surgeon know thyself and i think that's important that we reiterate that every surgeon should know yourself know the limit of your skill know what you are capable of doing and know when to call for help or know when to go under the tutelage of a better experienced surgeon so that you can better your skill and give patients a better outcome. And I'll just quickly summarize. Uh, surgeon, know yourself. Individualize your surgical care plan. Always discuss your care plan with your staff and with your patient. And before getting to that point, you must identify comorbidities, optimize comorbidities, and again, know yourself and individualize the patient's care plan during the selection process. Okay, so as part of our selection process, biometry and IO selection and planning for IOL is a next step. And then Dr. Temitepo Ewete, a corner ophthalmologist with the Mazi Specialist Eye Hospital Rediting Group, is up next. She'll be taking us on that for the next 20 minutes. Please keep your questions coming in through the Q&A. At the end of all presentations, we'll tackle all questions. I want to thank you for your time and your patience. And I know the weather isn't helping so much with internet connection. Also, thank you for hanging in there. So, Dr. Temitu Mawete, we can start. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So, um, I guess you can see my screen. So, I'll be talking quickly about biometry and IOL selection. I have no financial disclosures, although I wish I did. Now, for in, um, as an introduction, biometry is the process of measuring the various anatomical characteristics of the eye needed for the calculation of the appropriate power of the intraocular lens. And this involves anatomical measurements of the eye, and this includes the axial length, the keratometry, the anterior chamber depth, and all these are the components of the anterior segment biometry. Now, what are the types of biometry we have? We have the ultrasound biometry, which is the most common because it's cheaper. Most people have that. And we have the optical biometry or optical interferometry, which is um, the recent one, and it's a bit more um, expensive. Now, the ultrasound biometry has two types. We have the application biometry, and we have the immersion biometry. Now, ultrasound biometers use a pulse system. So this pulses electricity through the tip and the crystal elements in the trip in the tip vibrates and emits sound waves at a very high frequency. And for the A and B scans, this frequency is about 10 to 12 million Hertz. And this is pre-designed by the manufacturer. And this high frequency allows for a restricted depth of penetration of the sound into the body. And it also um, gives us excellent resolution of the small structures. So you now have the sound waves hitting at different interfaces, which is between any two media of the eye. And all these media in the eye have different densities and velocities. So, um, and for donation biometry, it requires that the ultrasound probe be placed directly on the corneal surface. And because of that, there's some degree of compression of the corneal surface, and it might be between 0 0.14 to 0 0.28 millimeters. So approximately, you can say between 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 millimeters is the degree of compression that you will have um, for the applanation biometry. And this is inter, um, it, it depends on the person operating the biometry. So here we can see a picture of a typical um, Applanation biometry, and you can see the spikes. Now, those um, letters um, correspond to what each spike means or what each spike is um, measuring. So, the A is the probe tip and cornea, the B is the lens, anterior lens capsule, 
The C is the posterior lens capsule. D retina is clearer than you have the orbital fat. So you can use this to even measure distance between. So A to B, you can say, oh, that is where the anterior chamber depth is and so on and so forth. When you see echoes between B to D steeply and steadily rising, it is most likely that your probe is on the visual axis. If you see the that there is no scleral or orbital fat echoes, that means you're probably aligned to the optic nerve. Now, what are the limitations for the applanation biometry? You could have variable corneal compression. You could have a broad sound beam without any specific localization, and you could have limited resolution. Now, for if, um, immersion biometry, this is accomplished by putting a small scleral shell between the lids and filling it with water or saline, and the probe is carefully immersed in the fluid. Now, this takes some, this takes a bit of learning curve, and it also requires that the patient is lying flat. It is usually more accurate than the applanation um, technique because there is no corneal compression by the probe, and because you have the fluid there, you have a a difference of between 0 0.14 to 0 0.036 millimeters um, longer for the biometry, for the axial length measured with this method as compared to the biometry done with the applanation method. And we should also note that this um, biometry gives six spikes instead of five. So you can see a picture of a typical immersion A scan biometry. So for A, you have the probe tip. Now this probe tip is now um, away from the cornea. So B and the double peak echo will show both the anterior and posterior. C is the anterior lens capsule, D is the posterior lens capsule, then you have the retina, the sclera, and the orbital fat. So you have you have A to G versus A to F, which you had in the A T um, micrometer infrared lights. So I'm not going to go into all this. And also increasing the accuracy is that contact with the cornea is not needed. So you are eliminating variations due to compression cornea. And since it measures to the center of the macula, it gives the refractive axial length versus the anatomical axial length, which is achieved with the ultrasound biometry. And it also incorporates the actual thickness of the retina, but as, as um, opposed to the ultrasound, which just gives a standard 200 microns to the axial length, which accounts for the retina thickness. So for the optical biometry, what do you expect it to measure? So you have everything the ultrasound measures, but it also takes into account the um, white to white distance of the cornea. And usually you have the inbuilt IO and power calculation by different, it gives you a full reading of everything. So you see all the form. Media opacity, like cornea opacity for dense cataract, vitreous. It seems we have got a little technical issue with Dr. Temitofe Wete's connection. So, um, Dr. Abdullahi, are you with us? While we wait for Dr. Temitofe Wete, if we have a question directed to Dr. Abdullahi, Dr. Abdullahi, or are we having another? No, I am. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we, okay, very good. So while we wait for the to come back on, we have a question for you. 
Um, so the question is, what technique can you use to examine the zonals during examination of during examination of the lens? So uh, evaluation of the zonals of the lens requires a well dilated examination using the slit lamp. Well dilated examination here is not just like either a mid dilated, but the pupils really need to be fully dilated. So in a setting of a fully dilated eye, you do slit lamp examination. And when you have weak zonals, you now tend to see that the lens will push forward anteriorly with decrease in the anterior chamber depth. So you have a de decrease anterior chamber depth and also a lens that is pushing forward. That is something to tell you that you have a weak Sorry, zone. I think... Um... I think I got signed out. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I think you yeah, we have some tech issues from I think okay. from your end or so. Um, mm -hmm. so why you're trying to resolve that, Dr. Adamo is trying to answer one question mm -hmm. that we sent to him. But is it resolved now? Yes. Okay. So a well dilated examination with the shallowing of the AC and the forward pushing of even the peripheral iris is a pointer to a weak zonus. And it's a call for caution during surgery because if you have other features, you might be dealing with conditions such as the exfoliative syndrome. Yeah, and if I could quickly add to, um, if you miss a weak zone on examination on table while doing a capsuloresis, wrinkling of the anterior capsule on in attempt at puncturing to start a capsuloresis can also point to the fact that you've got some weak zones, which will also call for caution in um, doing your rexis. That's not the kind of patient you want to do a, a very vigorous rexis or attempt a can opener because you definitely lose support for the capsule during um, surgery. And so we have another question for Dr. Abdullahi. Um, okay, the question is, thank you for the one of mention. In a patient who has glaucoma on a prostaglandin analog and a beta blocker, but has agreed to be operated so do we stop the anti-glaucoma medication till after surgery, or do we continue, or do we change the medication? Uh, what, what is important in trying to stop especially is the prostaglandin analog. Because we know the prostaglandins are inflammatory mediators. So, and we know the cataract surgery itself is exposing the patient to inflammation analog. So, we need to we know. stop the uh, prostaglandin analog, but we may continue with the beta blockers like Timolol. Then the cataract surgery itself, when you do, you don't have any fear that you operated and you withdraw that drug because the cataract surgery on its own could lower the intraocular pressure so that the patient can, through the acute phase, either go with only single medication or even no medication at all. But definitely, if you continue with the prostaglandin analog, you may see an exaggerated inflammation that sometimes may scare you to think you are possibly dealing with a TAS, toxic anterior segment syndrome, not knowing that you are giving the patient a pro-inflammatory agent. So thank you very much, Dr. Abla. I think Dr. Tabito Kwewete is back with us. Dr. Kwewete, uh, are you back with us? Yes, I'm back. Okay. Whenever you're ready. So, um, where I just kept on talking. I didn't know that <laughs> I had been silent. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think okay. there were some network issues. Um, so if yes. you could share your screen now, if, if you can. Okay, let's see. Because I'm using another system yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Oh, uh -huh. okay. So, so, so I think you lost us some slides back. Okay, so. Yeah. Did everybody see this slide? Yeah, yeah. I think this was where you. This was where you went out. Okay, so I had not gone far. So yeah. the optical biometry has the inbuilt IR um, calculation. So you can see everything written out. 
and but you can't you can't use it where there's significant media opacity. So that is the drawback, especially in our environment where we see a lot of um, um, dense cataract. But what I found out in my own practice is I have a lot of people coming earlier and earlier that they want um, earlier cataract surgery, mostly because of the glare and inability for those that have um, significant cortical cataracts, they can't really read the screen when they have presentation. So that is becoming a, a problem. So you have this um, difference in accuracy. So you can see that the immersion A scan is very close to the accuracy of the IO master. So you can use that as opposed to the, but you, you look at these, these values and you feel that they are very small. But when you are talking about the degree of um, accuracy of axial length, you need it because every uh, millimeter can cost um, a degree, a significant degree of change in your IOL power. So it's very important to take note, especially of the um, axial length. Now, another trick that you do is when you're measuring, because a lot of us do not measure the axial length, we give it to our technicians to measure. So what I suggest to everybody is to sit with them once, a, once in a while and look at how they take the readings. By the time all those readings, a lot of the machines have like 10 readings. Once those readings are up to like 10, look at the standard deviation between those readings. You know that P should be less than 0 0.05. Once you have any P, any standard deviation that is more than that, then that means those readings are far off from each other. So we should take note of that. It is very important. So let's look at the biometric data. So a lot of times we assume that a lot of people fall within the normal reading. So you have 96% of axial lengths falling between 21 to 25 millimeters. Six percent, sixty percent is between cent of, and usually, if there's an absence of pathology between the two eyes, um, most individuals have similar axial lengths in each eye. So another trick you should do is, even if the person is coming for one eye, measure both eyes and compare. It's quite important. So we we'll now look at the formula for um, for calculating IO power. Um, we have the first generation, which is the SRK formula, which assumed, which is based on regression formula, which looked at people at the back and just made a formula to make people fall between that. Then you have the, the second generation, which is the SRK2, which is a modification of FR, SRK formula, which takes into account the different axial lengths of the eye. And you now have the third generation. So for the third generation, you look at what size of the, what the axial length is and you, do your IOL calculation depending on the size of the eye. So that is also very important. Then you also have the fourth generation. Now, as more and more people are doing um, LASIK and refractive surgery, one also has to take into account the, so it's important nowadays to ask for history of refractive surgery so that you won't have a refractive su surprise after your, um, your surgeries. So in, in summary, you can see this. Most people will fall between this. Less than 22 millimeters, you do the OFAQ or SRKT. Less than um, 22 to 24.5, you do SRKT or Holiday or Hagis. And S, um, SRKT for greater than 24.6. So SRKT can be done for everybody. And there are these online calculators that one can use. So most people will just fall back and do the SRKT. It's the safest thing to do if you can't remember all these values, all right? So what is also important to note is that all these values take into account the fact that they are, in, they are just assuming that your IOL is going to be placed inside the capsular bag. And, but every time, so you're assuming that you've done a good capsulorexis and you're going to implant this lens in the bag. But by each um, degree, if you don't implant in the bag and you think you're implant, implanting in the sulcus, one has to make the necessary um, um, calculations. 
So these are the ones that, so normally what most of us do is we reduce by 0.5 to one, but that also depends on the axial length of the eye. So that should also be noticed. But remember, most people will fall between that 20, um, 20 to 25 diopters or 19, 19 to 23 diopters IOL. So you can reduce IOL by 0.5 to one diopter when you are putting in the ciliary, uh, in the sulcus. So that is important to know. So that is the first part of my presentation when I'm talking about the um, the Baumid out. One minute. So let's do this. Okay. Sorry, 10 seconds and we're good. Dr. Cyril, am I still good? Can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, very good. good. All right, thank you, thank you, because everybody seemed to have frozen into place. I wasn't sure if, <laughs> if, no, no. if you could hear. Okay, all right, so now we're going to go to our... We're going to go into IOL, the IOL slide. So this slide, we're just talking about um, the different types. Yeah, of um, IOLs that we have and how lens is an artificial lens implanted into the eye, which is usually used to replace the natural crystalline lens and it's made of different materials. It was first implanted by Harold Ridley, who saw like a plane of glass and thought about using it into the eye. Now, primary um, implantation of IOL, IOL is done at the time of cataract surgery, and secondary implantation is placed on um, is placing an intraocular lens in previously operated eyes, which is sometimes what we see when we do um, pediatric cataract surgery or when we are doing post um, post traumatic or if you have a complication after cataract surgery and you cannot put in the IOL at that time. Now, the, the IOL has two parts. The optic, which is the part that focuses light on the retina, and the haptic, which is part of the IOL that acts to give support to the haptic. Now, what are the different materials used for IOL? The base, the common ones, there are so many materials now. So you have the, the non-foldable rigid type, which the most popular one is the PMMA lenses, which is the polymethyl metacrylate lenses, and the foldable ones for which we have different types, the silicone, the hydrophilic acrylic, the hydrophobic acrylic, the newer types where you have the hydrogel and the ro rollable or the ortho thin. Then what is used to make the haptic materials also important. Now for the PMMA lens, you should know that this is hard and rigid. It is hydrophobic and it can cause adherence of um, bacteria. And the refractive index is usually between 1.47 and 1.55. Now for the acrylic lenses, two major types, the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic. Now for the hydrophilic acrylic, which is what a lot of people like. Now the reason why we, um, we like this so much is because it unfolds in a very controllable manner. It has good uveal and capsule compatibility, meaning that, you know, cataract surgery is inside some inflammation in the eye. Um, but for the hydrophilic lenses, you don't have a lot of reaction to the lens. But the main disadvantage is the higher rate of um, posterior capsular opacification than in other materials. And it has a lower resistance for capsular bag contraction, meaning that it can move. When the capsular bag contracts, you can see the lens move in different directions. Now for the hydrophobic, it has a better, yes. Hello? Your slides, your slides aren't showing it, anymore. You can't see it anymore. No, no, no. We are still seeing the slides for the previous uh, presentation. Oh, really? Yes, please. Okay, so let me, let me, Sorry about that. Okay, sorry. Is this better? Yeah, yeah, we're seeing it now. 
Okay, so now for the for the um, hydrophobic IOL, it has a better performance in preventing PCOs. And it has an increased elasticity at higher temperatures. So that's why some people, when if your theater, many people's theaters are very cold. When, if your theater is very cold, it's better not to um, put it, um, leave the IOL out in your, um, in your theater, especially if it's very cold, because then you will have problems inserting it because it doesn't fold very well. It becomes less elastic when it's in a cold environment. So most times it is brought out just before it is implanted. So it doesn't stay in the cold for too long. Um, is, do you get that? Now for the silicon IOLs, that is not usually very commonly used. Although it's a really nice IOL, it's usually thinner. It is capable of large and reversible deformations. It is hydrophobic. But the problem is that there's a higher um, chance of it having surface deposits. And there was this um, so, um, study that was done that showed that he, it had a higher chance of have, uh, people have a higher chance of getting end of thermitis after implantation. Silicon oil put, put, put in, there's the adherence of the silicon oil to this lens. So if you have people that, we know that um, retinal detachment is one of the complications that one can see after cataract surgery. And if you have to put in a silicone, a silicone oil after cataract surgery, then this IOL is a no-no. So you don't want to use it when you have a high myopic patient or people with retinal breaks or post-retrectomy patients, or patients you want to do retrectomy at the same time. Now, hydrogel lenses hydrate to become soft and rubbery. So it is hydrophilic, so it repels cells and microbes. The advanced, what, why they were trying to develop this lens is they wanted a lens that could move easily in the bag and adjust because um, during um, accommodation. Now, the intraocular lens design is also very important. You have the multi-piece or the single-piece lens. You want to know if it's round-edged or sharp-edged. You want to know if the, the haptic is plate or is loop. You want to know if it's angulated. You want to know if it's toric, multifocal, or if it's spheric. So these are pictures. So the first two on your left are the multi-piece lenses. You can see that the materials of the haptic seem to be different from the materials of the optic. They seem to be stuck on. They are not made in one single uh, material. The ones on the right are the single piece. Now, these are the plate haptics. The plate haptics are usually um, single piece. So multi-piece or three-piece IOs are held in place by exerting centripetal or the ciliary sock is more suited to your posterior um, um, capsule support. And single-piece IOs are produced in a single stage. It's a single stage material. So the production of this is cheaper. So many of us that use the Indian um, IOs, as I said, I don't have any um, financial disclosures. This is cheaper to get these IOs. They are the ones that you find more commonly. And they might have, because of this, they are single-piece de um, design, they may have less of a PCO inhibiting effect because there's no pressure on the on the uh, on the bag to impede um, the PCO formation, and it's usually easier to implant. So, what are the IOLs you want to use for insufficient posterior, posterior capsule support? You want to use a multi-piece PCIOL. You can also do an optic capture. You want to use a scleral fixated IOL. You want to use an iris fixated IOL, or you want to use an angle supported ACIOL. So, all these IOLs are the ones that you should put in, you should use if you don't have sufficient pieces to support and not just use your regular PCIO. Now, the toric IOs are used to neutralize the effect of corneal astigmatism. Uh, for this, accurate placement is essential. For every degree of axis of the toric IO, there's a, a decrease of 3% of the toric um, correction. So, if that axis should shift by 30 degrees, you don't have any. Um, astigmatism correction anymore. How do you know the toric IOLs? You see these dots that are up here. That is where you place the IOLs. You, you align that to the angle of the um, astigmatism. There are toric calculators that one can get online to calculate.
the proper axis where this should be placed. And so the diffractive IO, uh, as I store IO and the thickness IO, and this has to do with their rings. So anytime you see some IOs, you see rings around them, that is a giveaway that this is a um, a multifocal IO because at those different points you can you can um, it can focus for intermediate, it can focus for for near, it can focus for distance. So this is an example of the thickness diffractive IO. You can see those rings here. So you have the central ring and you have the smaller rings going outward. So the central part is for distance is what is to think that okay when you want to see in bright light the pupil contracts and you're using that central point most of the time now this is the restore one so let's move on so for the refractive viral it also functions by creating multiple focal focal points that allow viewing at all distances they produce good quality distance intermediate and near vision but these are limited by pupillary diameter because of the zonal design of the lens. So if you look at this picture, you can see how it focuses light. So they have, it's like interchangeable. You have distance, you have near, you have distance, you have near at various points. So for these ones, the rings are further apart. They are not as closely packed as you see in the diffractive multifocal IO. Then you have the rollable IOs. These are the ultra thin IOs. So there, some some time ago there was there were this um, new type of um, um, fake emulsification that they were calling fake units, where the emulsion um, size about one millimeter is about zero point nine to one point four millimeters. So these IOs are, were made to fit inside those um, those kind of incisions because they are very thin, and they open up slowly. So the advantage of this is because there's, you, have, you can minimize astigmatism due to your surgeries. But they've not, they were not really popular. They are still not really popular because it is very difficult to perform fecal emulsification through such a small session. So you don't have people in factoring into it when choosing an intraocular lens prior to cataract surgery and you have a lot of choices. And patients are becoming more and more particular. So where, before you choose intraocular lens or when counseling for, for surgery, you, you should plan carefully, counsel patients, and you try to get IOs that meet the visual needs of your patients. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Ewete. Um, we want to thank you for keeping to time too. Oh, I kept to time. Uh, yeah, you did. <laughs> You did. All right, you thank did. you. You did, yeah. Um, so we've had our session on biometry and IO selection. So in summary, our for biometry, you must carefully pick a method, a method, even though for us in third world countries, our methods pick us. We may not be able to select a method that we need to select, but use the method that we have available. So in, in whatever method you may choose to use, please use the method properly. If you're using the contact biometry, then do not compress the cornea too much. If you have an optical yep. biometry, that's all well and good. But if, if you have patients that come to see us like they do with very dark cataracts, you may also have to fall back on contact biometry or immersion biometry. And then also, Asian lens measurement is very important. Um, you, must, you must be very sure they are measuring the right Asia lens. Like I always tell residents that are doing biometry and uh, contact biometry, I'll tell them the best, the safest method to make sure you're getting a good Asia lens is to take at least five or six readings and then take the longest reading. It's, it may not be scientifically correct, but if you take the longest reading, you are less likely to underestimate eye well correction for that patient, especially if the resident is not sure if he's compressing too much or if he's not touching the cornea at all. So Asia lens measurement is important. And then if we may have used the right method, made sure our Asia lens measurement was good. But if we took a measurement which uses an in the bag placement to calculate IOL power, and we do not make adjustments, and then we put that IOL in the sulcus, we will have a refractive surprise the next day. 
So three major things in biometry, method, correct Asia length, and in the back placement. And if we must put the eye well in the surface, then make correct adjustments. Then for IOL selection, in summary, IOLs are dependent. IOL selection is dependent on if the bag has sufficient support, if the patient has a refractive need. And then um, I think also whatever IOL you have in stock also matters. Like the, the poll we took, the entry poll we took showed that a lot of us use IOLs based on what we have in our stores. So I think um, IOL you have in your store is so important for in your IOL selection. But if you are lucky to have various forms of IOLs in your store, then please, the fractive need of the patient, bad support. And then again, like Dr. Temito Kwewete said, previous refractive surgery done for the patient. I want to thank our faculties for spending the last one hour with us. We have a question for Dr. Temito Kwewete. The question is, what happens if the toric lens is misaligned? Dr. Wete, are you with us? Um, yes, I am. So okay. if the toric lens is, can you hear me, sorry? Yes, we can hear you. So it now depends on when the patient gets back to you after, um, after the complaint. Because it might, it depends. So that's why the size of the, um, so for those kind of premium lenses, the size of the capsulorexis matters. Because with capsular contraction, the, with the anterior capsular contraction, it can cause a rotation of the toric IOL. Now, it depends on when you see the patient again. If you see the patient early enough and the, there's no um, um, had adhesion yet, you can go back and realign the IOL and make a bigger capsulorexis if it is due to a... A, um, if it's due to a small capsulorexis. Now, if it's, it was a, um, um, a while after, or maybe you didn't get the correct alignment, or if the patient is still not tolerating the um, toric IOL, one can just remove the toric IOL, that's do a, an IOL exchange, put in another IOL, and correct the person with spectacles. It should also be noted that it doesn't, con it doesn't um, correct all degrees of astigmatism. You have some people with very high astigmatism. It can correct up to about four diopters. So anything above four diopters, you have to add some other methods. And one has to be sure of why the person is having, which, which what is causing the, the um, astigmatism. It's not all forms of astigmatism that the toric IOL will, will correct. So that's why for that, sometimes you have to do the anterior corneal, anterior corneal curvature, posterior corneal curvature, and be sure exactly where the astigmatism is coming from. So re also go in, re-rotate, um, remove, those are your options, and correct with glasses or labor relaxing incisions or laser or, or LASIK. Those are the options. Thank you very much. You have another question. The question is, um, from your experience, um, how long post-op is it still possible to repeat a rexis, to, to make a wider rexis, move your IOL within the bag? How long post-op? And the second question is, um, if you don't have a biometer, how do you select an IOL for a patient? Huh. So how long post-op can you do a, to repeat, repeat a rexis? A re now, a rexis so or move your eye within the bag? Now you can, it depends on your comfort level. The safest period is within the first, first month when you don't have contraction, you don't have sticking together. Although there are ways to do it, you can, you can dissect it off with visco, but the safest period is within the first month if you want to do an IOL exchange. Although you can do an IOL exchange after any period, because I've had, I've had, I have a particular patient who developed a posterior, um, a, an IOL opacification, which is very rare from a, a hydrophilic 
click lens and it started gradually over one year. After a year, it's post up, um, it's post up um, um, refraction went from, uh, it's post up vision went from 6.5 to 6.24. And it wasn't improving with glasses because it was because the IOL was opacified, it was white. So that patient after a year had to have that IOL removed and replaced with another IOL. So in that case, what you are getting ready for, because it's likely that in that period of time, you are going to remove the IOL with the bag. You might not have this yeah, posterior yeah. capsule support. So you have to be prepared to have an, a, a three-piece IOL to put in the sulcus if you have enough anterior capsule support, or you do an, a scleral fixated IOL, or you do an iris claw IOL. So that is so somebody that it might not want to do it, an ACIO for somebody that has had FACO and used to good vision, then you now put an ACIO. So you might think to look at the other three options. Then second question. So the is other a, one for biometric. Yeah, if you don't have a biometer, yes, yeah, how do you select now, an IOL for the now, this is very difficult. So if you don't have a biometer, that means you are falling back to your um, regression method, your first your first um, generation IO calculation where you use. So hopefully, hopefully, let's just assume that you have the, you have, you can do the K reading. You have the um, manual keratometer, even if you have an, you don't have an auto keratometer. So if you have a manual keratometer and you have a B scan that can measure axial length, fine. Now, if you don't B scan, that means that you're assuming that that Hello, are you still with us? Exhale length. That's what you mean. So you now, use, you now need to adjust with your K reading with that. So you are using right. the regression formula for the SRK formula. So I think we lost you at a point where you're saying if you don't have a B scan. So if you don't have a B scan, you're assuming that you, the patient falls within um, the average. That's 22 to 24.5. That's the axial length. So you calculate with the regression formula for the SRK using that. Thank you very much. You have another question. Question says, yeah. um, what do we do when a patient has a previous refractive surgery and his previous refraction is not known? So if the patient has done a previous surgery and the refraction is not known, there's a formula that you can use is in my slide. There's a formula you can use to calculate. There are different formulas and you have um, the, the, um, what the different, um, and you also have online calculators for that. So there are different things you can do. There are different formulas that you can. So I will just quickly share my screen again so that I can just see those, a quick look of, of, all the, the, of all the formulas that you can use. But the important thing with this is good. Is the important thing is the person gives you a history that he has had refractive surgery. Once you have the history, then you are almost home and dry. So you can use any of these. Can you see the slide? Yes, we can see your slide. So you can see, you can use the corrected K, in which case you do the, um, you, um, you multiply 1.14 by the average K of that patient. So that's the corrected K of that patient. Or you do the, the corrected K be equals to the, the other one, the topography method where you do 1.114K minus 6.1. So as I said, there are plans to calculate that, but you have to get that history first before you can know to calculate that. Okay. Thank you very and many much. Of us don't, many of us don't ask because we just assume that we are not in an environment that people do refractive surgeries very much. But I think it's important that for us now, we need to ask because I've seen a few patients that have had LASIK, and some of them will not follow that information. They kind of want to know how much you know. It's kind of a test them, it's a joke to them. 
<laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I love you, Strona. Yes. <laughs> yeah. well, we're very grateful. We're very grateful for your time. And um, so just before we end, we'll yes. run our poll again, and then we'll exit after the poll and sorry the poll. Um, we'll have our third wireless, um, webinar will come up shortly again, as usual, the next quarter or earlier. We'll, we'll um, review that. So the, the, the poll is up. We're going to use 50, um, 60 seconds for the poll. Um, some respondents were here in the beginning, and they voted. So please vote again. Let's see if there's going to be any change. We don't expect any change, but it's an anonymous poll. And again, it doesn't test any knowledge. It's just a snap, just a window into what we practice in our various facilities. Okay, so I think we are almost done. I think it should be done now, I think so. Yep, so, uh -huh. okay, so, there's been some improvements. Um, initially, when we started our entry poll, a lot of us were only willing to operate patients who had visual acuity of 660 or worse. But now, I think um, a lot of us are going back to our centers, ready to operate anybody with any visual state, provided the patient complains. So that's a good thing. But before we go ahead to our centers, let's also remember what Dr. Abdullahi kept telling us, surgeon, know thyself know yourself, but I think it's a good thing to see that we are ready to go back to start surgeries on anybody with a visual complaint, regardless of the patient's visual acuity. And so this is also an improvement. Um, yep, so we are saying now that we'll be able to operate any patient after optimizing comorbidities and individualizing care, but however, a no-no for us would be a coexisting infection anywhere on the face. So that means we will have to treat any infection on the face to prevent endophthalmitis. We still agree that biometry is important in patients. And I will still say, which I think is, 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 um, is um, what's the word now? It's expected for our, for, our, for our practice environment. Our IOL choice is determined by what we have in stock. So a lot of us still think that availability of IOL material and design, whatever we have available is what determines what we use. So thank you very much for joining us and being patient with us, even through when we had some technical difficulties. And um, just a reminder that WOC is starting this week. And um, for those of us who registered at the virtual conference, please attend. The YOF will be holding its normal Saturday academic sessions because of the WOC program this Saturday to allow those of us who have registered attend and participate fully. Also, the OSN is sharing a poll on the state of the annual OSN conference this year. Please do, the emails have been sent to members who have registered, registered their mails to the OSN. Links for the polls are on the YOF um, Telegram, the OSN Telegram, and the NPMCN WhatsApp group pages and our various subspecialty subgroup pages. Please let's vote. Let's help the OSN decide on how we're gonna run our annual Congress this year. Thank you once again to our faculties, Dr. Adamo Abdullahi and Dr. Temito Pewete. You've given us very, 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 very sumptuous meal of discussions today. At that note, on that note, I would like to say goodbye from us. We hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much.